So what are these health inspectors? Anyway, we'll save them these two seats. If they turn up, they can sit right at the front. <laughs> What's going on, New South Wales Health? I mean, this is what happens when you work for the government. All right? They're, ne they're never on time. They never get the job done. Right? I mean, they're just, just frustrating to deal with sometimes, these government departments. What's that? They'll be here in six months. Be in six months. That's, that's what happens with the government departments. Okay? Getting donuts. <laughs> I don't think they're cops coming out. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 13. Uh, if you have a look at that verse there, it says, I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. The title for the sermon this morning is, I will surely consume them. Could you imagine the Lord saying that about us? Don't forget, you know, as we're reading through Jeremiah, yes, we are looking at a wicked nation. But don't forget that the people of the Jews, the, the people of, of Israel in this time, were God's people. Now, they aren't God's people today in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, they were still God's people, all right? And God is telling His people that I will surely consume them. Another way of saying that is, I will surely destroy you. Okay, and these are coming from the words of God. And of course, Jeremiah, as I've said many times, is quite a negative book. And if you were paying attention there toward the end, Jeremiah is feeling it. You know, Jeremiah is really, uh, you know, upset and concerned for his nation. You know, even though he's the one preaching these things, at the same time, he's not like, yeah, just, just burn down, you know, this, this wicked nation. Just burn it and, and, and just, just be, become destroyed. He's really worried about it. And you'll see uh, later as we go through this chapter, just how concerned Jeremiah becomes. But let's start there in verse number 1, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 1. At that time, saith the Lord, they, that the day here are the Babylonians. So when the Babylonians come in, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. The Bible's telling us here, the Babylonians are going to come in and they're going to go to the graveyard and basically dig up the graves. They're going to open, open up, you know, and, and take out the bones, take out these dead bodies. And, you, know, you know, if you go to a grave site, I'm sure there are many bones. But also there'll be people that have recently died. There's going to be decomposing flesh. I mean, get this idea in your head. You know, it's not just ransacking, ran ransacking a, a city, not just burning down a city, but they're going to defile the land. You know, normally when you think about a, a, a place, a, a grave, you know, uh, you think of a place where, where people go and pay their respects for those that have gone before, the generation that have gone before. You know, you, you give people a, a, a burial, you know, to, to respect uh, their body and to respect their legacy. As, as I said, it's a place where you can go and, and think about, you know, maybe a loved one that has gone before. And look, these are kings, these are princes, these are, these are prophets of the past. So I'm sure many of these bodies are people that served God faithfully. All right, and so there's a, there's a legacy there. When the Israelites look at their grave, they say, man, look at the great prophets we had. Look at the great kings we had. The Babylonians are going to come and defile us. Like, you, you think that's great? You think your past is great? We're just going to dig up the graves. We're just going to let, let the bodies de decompose there on, on the land. All right? And look at verse number 2. It says, And they shall spread them, that spread the bodies, before the sun and the moon and all the hosts of heaven, so the sun and the moon, it's going to, like, of course, the sun's going to decompose. Think about the stench, right, of these heat on these dead bodies and all the hosts of heaven, uh, you know, that's the stars. And so, so the Babylonians would worship the sun, the moon, the stars, whom they have loved. So they've loved those things and whom they have served and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. So they, again, they worship the sun, moon and stars. They shall not be gathered nor be buried. For, uh, they shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. So these, these bodies are just going to be dung. They're going to decompose on the land. And it's kind of this idea that, you know, uh, the, the Jews in these days, they would glory in their historical past. As I said to you, they would glory in their, in their, in their prophets. They would glory in their kings. They would glory in the past. Say, look, look what great nation we were in the past. Well, the Babylonians, they glory or they worship the sun, moon, and stars. And it's kind of like you're defiling the, the history of, of, of Judah uh, to appease your sun god and your moon god and your stars. And it's kind of shown, hey, you know, the things we worship have a greater priority over these things that are going to be smelling and decomposing. So what we get out of that, brethren, a lesson that we can definitely get out of this is that we should not rely on past victories. 
You know, we should never be at church that says, well, you know, we've gone over two years now. You know, yeah, you know, two years ago, we, we did great works as a church. You know, two years ago, we had this many people saved. You know, two years, you know, you know thinking about the past and thinking about the great days. Hey, you know, we're an independent fundamental Baptist church. You know, it, it's, it's not good to get stuck. Oh, man, you know, the, 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 the Baptists of the past and the 40s and the 50s, the great missionary works. Why aren't we doing those kinds of things? Look, forget the past. The past is great. The past is a great place to, to be a stepping stone for the future. But the Jews here, they were just fixed on the past. They were fixed how God had served them, how God had uh, you know, uh, you know, pulled, you know, got them out of the land of Egypt, how God had so, uh, them, uh, uh, sorry, uh, helped them through many victories. And they were relying on that rather than thinking about the future. Rather than thinking, hey, what can we do from this day forward? You know, great, the generations of the past are great. Hey, but what can we do today? What can we do tomorrow? Keep your finger there. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. The past is good, brethren, but let's not live in the past. Okay? Let's look to the future. And here's the, the problem with the Jews in these days. They were stuck in the past. You know, and, and God was basically allowing the Babylonians to just dig up your past and defile your past. It means nothing. Because you're not serving me today. All right? In Matthew chapter 3, verse number 9, these are the words of John the Baptist. He says to the Jews of those days, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And so once again you see there that the Jews in this time, they thought, well, we're descendants of Abraham. We're God's chosen people. Isn't that what they say today? Isn't that what they say today? Well, we're children of Abraham. You know, and God, you know, made all these promises to Abraham and we deserve all those promises as well. You know, we're the special people of God. Listen, stop living in the past. The reason why, you know, your, your land is so messed up, the reason why, you know, your, your religion is a false religion that doesn't worship the true God is because they're still living in the past and they're not ready to receive Christ as Savior and move on with their lives. We can't become like that, brethren. We can't become like that. Okay? Because if we just live in the past, expect God to come in and allow His judgment to fall and for the past to be ripped up and you're left with nothing. All right? And so what I, what I get out of this, especially for my children, because, you know, my children are growing up as pastor's children, right? Pastor's kids. And boy, how many times have I seen pastor's kids be like the worst kids in the church? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, can anyone testify of that? You know, these are the pastor's kids and like the worst kids, the most disobedient kids, right? They get, they get into, and here's the thing, they might say, well, we have Abraham to our father. Hey, our, our, our dad's a pastor. So what? So what? Right? You're still children. You still have foolishness bound up in the heart, you know, the heart of a child. You can still do stupid things. You know, God's not impressed that your father's a pastor, God's impressed if you serve God. God's impressed if you get, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, submit yourself to the will of God and, and follow after God's ways. You can't just rely on the past. You can't just say, well, I grew up in a Christian home. Oh, I came from generations of Christians. You know, my father was faithfully serving the church. Yeah, but are you serving the church? Oh, I used to be, you know, I used to be in the church. Uh, I, I used to be the Sunday school teacher. I used to sing in the church choir. Okay, that's great. That's the past. But what are you doing today for the Lord? That's what matters. You know, God, God we're going to reward you for the past. Don't worry about that, okay? But you still have many days. You have, still have many years to serve God. What are you doing with your time today? So that's the lesson we have to get out of this. The Jews were not serving God today. They were relying on the past, thinking, well, God's come through in the past before. He's going to come through for us again. It's not going to happen, right? Let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 3. Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse number 3. And death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family, which remain in all the places whither I have driven them, saith the Lord. What it's saying here, after the destruction and the captivity, people are going to wish they died. In instead, of, instead of living and being taken into captivity and being dispersed of the land, people are just going to be like, I wish I just died when the Babylonians came. Okay? I mean, that's the kind of destruction you're going to think of, right? Just the, the defiling of the land. Verse number four. Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, they shall fall, sorry, shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away and not return? God is saying, look, again, you know, don't forget the captivity. The, the Babylonians come at the, end of the at the end of this book, chapter 52 of Jeremiah. We're still in the early days. We're still in Jeremiah chapter 8. 
Even though all this destruction is being prophesied of, God is still telling them there's still time. There's still time before you become this rejected nation that's going to be in Babylonian captivity for some 70 years. There's still time. And he's saying, look, it says, look, it's, a, you know, God's asking just a very basic common question. Shall they fall and not arise? He's saying, look, when you fall down, don't you just get back up? Normally, like if you're walking and you trip and you fall, are you just going to stay fall? Are you going to stay in that state where you have fallen? And look, Judah had fallen. They had fallen in the eyes of God. And God's saying, look, are you going to just stay in this same position? Aren't you going to get up? Listen, little babies know they get up and they fall. Right? Little, ba- little toddlers that are learning to walk. I'm sure you've all seen them. When they start to, they get up on their legs, they're holding on, eventually they let go, and they start taking their steps. Listen, they fall time and time again. Sometimes they even hurt themselves. But listen, if they don't get back up, they're never going to walk, are they? You know, if they just fall once, say, well, this is too hard, I'm going to just stay in a, in a state of, on the floor, you know, they're not going to grow, they're not going to develop. No, common sense tells us when we fall, we get back up. But Judah had got to a point where they were so fallen from God and they, they were not getting up. They were not you know, coming back to the Lord. And God's saying, look, can't you do this? Don't you understand? This is a basic concept. And in you know, Proverbs 24, verse 16, I'll just read it to you. It says, for a just man fall off seven times. A just man. You know, a just man is someone that is justified before, for, before God. This is a righteous man. This is someone that serves God. You know, you can fall seven times. You know, you can, you, we will continue to fall. We will continue to sin. We're going to continue to make mistakes in our life. But when we make those mistakes, it says, For a just man falls seven times and riseth up again. That's what a just man does. When you fall, you get back up. It says, But the wicked shall fall into mischief. So when the wicked fall, okay, when they get into a bad state, when they commit wicked things, they're going to stay in that wickedness. Okay, but the just man, our job, brethren, is to get back up, you know, dust the, you know, uh, dust the, you know, the dirt off our feet, right? Get back up and just serve God. Judah was not doing this. And here's the danger, verse number five. The danger then, Jeremiah 8, verse number five, is this. Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back? Now, I'll stop there for a moment. Slidden back, what do you get? What's the idea there? Backsliding, yeah, backsliding, okay? And we know that as Christians, we can backslide, all right? Now, I've already preached on backsliding before, but there's a real danger. If you get to a place of backsliding, if you don't get back up, okay, if you don't, if you don't you know, fix yourself, you will continue to backslide. Okay? And, and think, about, think about a slide. You know, when you go down a slide, you know, I try not to go down slides too much now because I'm a lot heavier than I was before, but you, know, you go down a slide, you know, it, it's a quick descent, right? It's a quick descent. But here's the thing about a slide. Once you get off a slide, you're done. And you can get back on the slide and have fun and go up the slide again. Well, when it comes to backsliding, the, the real danger is, I'll just read verse number 5 again. It says here, Why then uh, is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? What does perpetual mean? Continuous. Continuous. It continues. It never ends. What God is saying here is, if you get to a point where you're backslidden as a Christian, you've got time to get back up. But if you keep sliding down, there comes a time when it's a perpetual backsliding. You just cannot get back up, right? You, you slide, you backslide. God's saying, hey, get back up, back up, get back up, get back up. You're like, no, I'm not going to go to church. No, I'm going to stop reading my Bible. No, I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to pray. At some point, boom, even as a Christian, you can just be completely out of the will of God. And God's done with you. It's a, it's a perpetual backsliding. You can't get back up. You're no longer a use to God is what I'm trying to say. So you don't want to get to that point where you just fall off the cliff. You know, if you're backsliding, let that be a warning to you and say, I don't want to get to that point where it becomes perpetual. Right? Just start, I can't get back up, you know? And, and if you're in a backsliding state, listen, just, just open up the Bible, confess your sins to God, go and say sorry, get back in church, start reading your Bible again, start praying, start going soul winning again. Hey, just start serving God again and He'll get you back up where you used to be. He'll help you get back where you are, right? But Judah here, perpetual backsliding. It says here, they hold fast deceit. Verse number five. They refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented of his wickedness. They're doing wicked. They don't repent. They don't say sorry to God. Saying, what have I done? They're saying, what, what, what wickedness? I mean, that's, we talked about a reprobate. Now, these aren't, you know, we know this became a reprobate nation. 
Again, a lot of these people, are, they are the people of God as far as the Old Covenant goes. Some are saved, many are not saved, okay? But you get to a point where, you know, even when you're doing wickedness, you know, you get so used to your sin, so used to your wicked behavior, and you're like, well, what have I done? Well, it's all good, right? I mean, you know, a, a pastor might get behind the pulpit, a preacher might get behind the pulpit and preach against your sin, and you're like, well, it doesn't bother me, you know? Well, that's, that's the danger of being backslidden. You, don't, you, you start forgetting the laws of God. You start forgetting what is right and wrong. So we have to be careful, right? What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rusheth into, into battle. All right. Can you please uh, go to Matthew chapter 5 for me? Matthew chapter 5. And again, this is probably not a teaching that is commonly heard in your average church. But as I said to you, even a Christian can get to a point where they backslide so much that they literally fall off the cliff, never to get back up again. No use to God ever again. Okay? Now, they're saved. They're going to heaven. Praise God. You can't lose your salvation. I don't want to give you that idea. But I'm just saying the service that you can do for God on this earth is over because you're that backslidden. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 13. Matthew 5, 13 reads, Ye are the salt of the earth. Now, what do we use salt for? Normally for cooking, right? For flavor, bring out the flavors. Maybe for... Uh, my mum used to put salt on mosquito bites. I get mosquito bites, I get, they get itchy. I put, put a bit of salt there, you know, it'll help you overcome the itchiness, right? And uh, kills any kind of germs and stuff like that. Hey, salt has a lot of, you know, preservatives. Salt has a lot of use. And you know what? We are the salt of the earth. God has a lot of use for us. You know, we ought to, uh, we ought to be, you know, people that preserve this nation. We ought to be people that add a bit of flavor. <laughs> to, this, to this wicked world, right? Uh, and uh, sometimes salt can be irritating though, right? You ever, you know, if you ever jumped in, in, a, in, in the ocean, had a bit of a swim, you get that salt water in your eyes, uh, you know, your eyes go red, it's a bit irritating. Sometimes Christians can be a bit irritating to the world. So be it. That's what salt does, right? All right? You're the salt of the earth, but look at this. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Boy, if you lose your savor, if you lose your saltiness, brethren, what did it say there? It says, Where, wherewith shall it be salted? It can't be salted again. Okay? It is henceforth good for nothing. Boy, if you get to that point of a perpetual backsliding, the, God's telling us you are good for nothing. Like, you're, you're walking the earth, you know, you're Christian, you're going to heaven, but you're not able to do anything for God. You're not useful to God anymore. What a scary place to be as a Christian, right? Like, no more rewards in heaven. You're not going to do anything. You know, I don't know how much God's going to protect you in that case. You know, you're good for now. Look, to be cast out and to be trodden on the foot of men, that's what you're good for. Just to be stepped on, right? Please go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse number 4. John chapter 15 and verse number 4. Brethren, just get into the habit, please. Get into the habit of just confessing your sins every single day. Just, just get into the habit. You sin every day. I sin every day. Just get into the habit every day. Lord, please forgive me for my sins. Name your sins. Name the wrong... Don't be... Oh, what have I done? Don't be like that. Say, Lord, I've done these things. I'm probably going to do them tomorrow because I'm a wicked man. Can you help me, Lord? I'm sorry, Lord. I'm, I'm, you know, I've got this sinful flesh with me. But Lord, I don't want to get to that point where I'm perpetually backsliding. At least if I come before you and confess my sins, at least I know for that brief moment, Lord, that I'm, I'm walking with you. For that brief moment, I know that my sins have been forgiven and we can have fellowship, Lord. You know, can you please help me so I don't get to that point where I just perpetually backslide? Amen. You know, but if you don't confess your sins, brethren, you know, and, and you walk away from the Lord, who knows what could happen to you? John chapter 15, verse 4. John chapter 15, verse 4. Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it, it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. So Jesus is saying, look, abide in me. Stay with me. Stay in fellowship with me. Verse number 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Brethren, we had a few souls saved yesterday. You know, we were able to bring forth some fruits yesterday. You know why? Because those soul winners that went out were abiding in Christ. Praise God. 
All right? Hey, yeah, uh, nothing wrong. We can throw in the fruit of the Spirit here if you want. The more you abide in Christ, the more the Holy Spirit can work in your life and you can be more Christ-like. Absolutely. But we need to abide in Christ. We need to stay in fellowship with Jesus Christ. All right? Verse, but look at verse number 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. You think, well, maybe this branch can be saved. No. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Okay, so if, if you're a gardener and you, you're, you know, you're trying to grow this tree and you notice, hey, this tree is dead, the branches are withered, what are you going to do? You need that room for something that is fruitful. You're going to you know, break those, those branches. You're going to cut down that tree, whatever it is. You're going to throw it into the fire. You're going to burn it up, right? And it's going to be use, no good for nothing. You know, God will replace you with somebody else that can be fruitful. And again, I'm not talking about salvation here. Just because it says burn with fire is not saying you're going to go to hell. Okay, these are illustrations. Do we build our doctrines on illustrations alone? Absolutely not. Okay, that's what I'm teaching the men on Fridays. You know, I've seen people take this passage and say we can lose your salvation. If you lose your salvation, you're going to go to hell if you don't abide in Christ. It becomes a works-based, you know, uh, gospel. Anyway, you've got to be careful with those kinds of illustrations. But you see here that Christians can get to a point in time where they are no longer fruitful for God. They are no longer salty. They've lost their saltiness. You're, better off, you're, you're no good for nothing except to be burnt like a, like a, like a branch. Okay? That's a scary thought. I don't want anybody in this church to get to that point. You know, I, would, I would be so saddened if anybody in this church got to a point where they were no longer any use to God and they're still walking this earth. It's amazing. Back to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 7. Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse number 7. We're going to read a, a whole bunch of birds here. It says, Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times. What we're looking at here, the appointed times, you know how birds tend to migrate? You know, they, they, they kind of know the seasons and the weather and they know to, to uh, you know, to reproduce and uh, to find food. They have to migrate sometimes north and south, things like that. Well, that's what this is about, okay? Yea, the stork in the heaven know for appointed times, and the turtle, it says turtle there, it's talking about a turtle dove, not, not the, you know. What is a turtle? It's a reptile, right? It's a reptile. It's not, not, not that kind of turtle, but the turtle dove. And it says, and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. Okay, so what this is teaching us is, you know, birds know, as I said, when to migrate. There's, there's something instinctive in a bird to know when they have to travel, right? And, uh, you know, even when springtime comes, there's something instinctive in birds. You often see birds gathering uh, twigs and sticks because they're, they're ready to nest, right? They've got this instinct in them. They know when the time is right, right? And so, look, even, even dumb animals know when the, time is, when the time is, you know, for them to act and for them to move and when them to, to perform and do their duties. But it says, but my people know if not the judgment of the Lord. So it's saying, look, our, God's people doesn't even know when God's judgment is falling upon them. And I've had to meditate on this passage quite a lot. You know, thinking about Jeremiah, thinking about Babylon, thinking about our restrictions, thinking about COVID-19. And... Uh, you know, I've, I've come to just my, my own understanding. This whole thing, to me, is the judgment of God on this wicked world. I, how much more wicked can this world get, honestly? How much more wicked can our nation get? And expect God's judgment not to fall upon us. Now, what, whatever your thoughts are on COVID-19, let, let's say it is a pestilence, a legitimate pestilence. I know it's real. I know it's real. I don't know how... How real, <laughs> as far as the media portrays it to be. It's definitely real, right? And we know that God sends pestilences as his judgment. Okay, we, we definitely see that multiple times in the Bible. But even if you don't believe it's necessarily, you know, it, it's blown out of proportion, I think it's blown out of proportion. But even seeing how the governments in this world, right? Even the fact that we're going to be inspected by New South Wales Health, okay? By, by, the, by the powers that be in this world, right? This can also be a judgment of God. This can also be a judgment that falls upon uh, God's people or, or the nations that are under God. Because again, we see that it's the Babylonians coming, right? The Babylonians are coming and doing despicable things. They're doing crazy things. Digging up dead bodies out of graves? I mean, how, how crazy can you get? I mean, but God is sending the Babylonians. And so I've had to sort of think about this a little bit. Think about what is the judgment of God? You know, I don't want to be someone where God will say, Pastor Kevin, don't you know God's judgment has fallen? Don't you know? Hey, even the birds know. 
Even they have an instinct. Even they understand when it's time to migrate and to nest, etc. Now, you know, I've been brought to think about this, right? You know, God's judgment. What is God's judgment like? And you know what? Jeremiah is a faithful man. Jeremiah is a prophet of God. Hey, there are other prophets of God during this time doing great things. There are, I'm sure there are other priests in the temple that want to serve God properly, but there's corruption, Lord, in the house of God. There's corruption in the government. I'm sure there are great people of God in this land. But listen, as, as far as the nation goes, it's been rejected by God. God's sending His judgment, and unfortunately, sometimes God's people are going to get caught in the middle of it. Now, we expect God to look after His people. You know, what else? You know, when the Babylonians come, we know the story of, da of Daniel. You know, Daniel's such a great man. A lot of people love preaching about Daniel. God gave Daniel so much wisdom, so much knowledge. We know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his three friends. Okay, these are all godly men, all right, who decided to just die in, in the furnace if they had to, you know, in, instead of bowing down and worshipping a false idol. Right, these are great men. Hey, but they were taken into captivity, were they not? Hey, they were stripped out of their homes. They were stripped away from their families. They were taken as young men, right? I'm, I'm sure they probably thought they had a great future for themselves in the land of Judah, that they were people that loved God. But unfortunately, sometimes God's people are just caught in the middle of God's judgment. But even when you are caught in the middle of God's judgment, God used those men in a powerful way, did He not? In the Babylonian kingdom? Yeah, so, you know, who knows? I, I don't know what to expect, brethren. I don't know if 2020 is going to be the end of it. I don't know if 2021 is going to be back to normal. Part of me kind of starts to think maybe 2021 is going to be even worse. I don't know. <laughs> Do you think so, brother? Could be. Could be. Okay? And we just have to prepare ourselves. I don't want to be like, the, like this. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. I think we need to just accept this may very well be God's judgment you know, on Australia. Not just Australia, but the whole world. The whole world's going crazy. Verse number 8. How do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. This is, of course, sarcasm. It says, lo, certainly in vain made he it. It's talking about the law of God. It's saying, like, God must have made his laws, laws in vain. Sarcasm. Of course, God did not make his laws in vain. Of course, they serve a pur purpose. Of course, they're profitable. But the people of this land, they're saying, we are wise. We've got the law of God. We've got the Bible. We've got the scriptures. He says, look, it's all in vain. If you've got it, all right? And the pen of the scribes, they're the copiers. The people that were copying the, the manuscripts, right? You've all got a Bible in your hands. You know, now we've used, we have technology. We have the printing press. Verse number nine. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord. And what wisdom is in them? So they have the word of the Lord. They think they're wise because they have the word of the Lord. All right? But it says here they have rejected, right? They have rejected the word. And you know, I, 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 my, my wife, before she got saved, she was a Roman Catholic. And uh, she used to tell me that she, she had all these things. She had all these, uh, the, the rosary beads. She had some cloth thing that you put on. Uh, she had all, the, all her statues and her, her images. And uh, she, had, she had it all, you know, she had it all. Uh, but the one thing that she did also do, she had a Bible. I don't know what kind of Bible she had, but she had a Bible and she would leave it on her bedside table opened. Opened. She'd say, why? Like, for good luck. <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, for, for protection from, from, you know, devils, from demons. You know, opened. And if you ask my wife, did you read the Bible? No. It was there though, Right. And that's what Catholics think. So oh, we, got, we, got the, we got the word. Well, it's not really the word of God that they hold. But anyway, they think they have the word of God. That they, they open it up. It's going to give us luck. It's going to give us protection. They don't read the word of God. They reject the word of God. And so it is vain for them. But brethren, what about us? I can see right now you all have a copy of the Bible in your hands. Praise God. I'm glad you bring it to church. You know, thank God for that. That's awesome. But what about at home? Is it opened at home? Do you read the Bible at home? Do you open it up in the morning and see what God has to say to you? Or is it all in vain? You've got the Bible there. You think you're wise because you know a few things in the Bible. You know some doctrines. But if you're not picking up and reading it, brethren, and not just reading it, listening to what God has to say to you and doing what God has to say to you, it's all in vain. It's all in vain. 
It's a sad thing because we all have Bibles. In that day and age, they didn't all have Bibles. You know, in the day of Jesus Christ, you had to go to the synagogue to just hear God's word being preached. Because, you know, it had to be written down by scribes. Could you imagine, you know, making copies? Today, we're blessed. We have the printing press, as I said. We're blessed. We have the whole Bible, all 66 books, all the Old Testament, all the New Testament. We have the King James Bible. We have the perfect word of God in our own language. And it wouldn't surprise me if people in our church still don't pick up their Bibles and read it. Probably happens, right? Maybe you can say to me, there's been a day this week, Pastor Kevin, that I did not pick up my Bible this week and read it. Maybe there's been two days, three days, four days, five days. In fact, Pastor Kevin, maybe Sunday's the only day I brought my Bible and opened it. Well, that's, that's a shame. And it's all in vain. Okay, it's all in vain. So please love the Word of God that you have in your hands. Let's not be. Let's learn the lessons from Judah, right? Let's not be those, those people. Verse number 10. Therefore will I give their wives unto others. That's the saddest thing, I think. So wives are going to be stripped away from their husbands and given to other men during this captivity period. And their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one of the least, even unto the greatest, is given to covetousness. From the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. So the reason I read all that is most of that is a repetition. Maybe you're familiar with those verses already. It's a repetition of chapter 6, verses 13 to 15, which I've already preached. A lot of that is very similar. Uh, there is one key difference there that I want to talk about, though. And if you go back to verse number 10, it said halfway through, For every one from the least, even unto the greatest, is given to covetousness. So this entire nation had become covetous. From the, from the greatest, from the one that has a lot of wealth, even the poorest people were given to covetousness. Now please take your Bibles and turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 13. Again, keep your finger there in Jeremiah 8, but turn to Hebrews 13 for me. Um, Isabel, could you just bring me the bottle of water? Go to Hebrews 13. And uh, covetousness. What is covetousness? Covetousness is desiring what somebody else has. All right? Now, it's, it's one of the Ten Commandments. I'll just read to you one of the Ten Commandments there. Exodus 20, verse 17 says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Hey, that's covetousness. You look at your neighbor, they've got a wonderful double-story mansion or something. Oh, man, I wish I had that. Hey, that would be covetousness. It says here, uh, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Oh, wow, I can't believe he married that woman. I'm not, you know, I wish that was my wife. Hey, that's covetousness. Nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass. Okay, so the things, his possessions, his, he has servants, all right? he's got uh, tools, he's got you know, the ox and the ass to plow the ground and to do work. You know, the things that he possesses, oh man, I wish I had what he has. Hey, that's covetousness. Okay? It's one of the Ten Commandments. Nor anything that is thy neighbor's. If you desire what somebody else has, brethren, that's covetousness. Say, so what is the problem with covetousness? You're in Hebrews 13, verse number 5. Look at this. Hebrews 13, verse 5, it says, Let your conversation, conversation is like your behavior, your lifestyle. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Why should it be without covetousness? And be content with such things as ye have, for he have said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You know what the problem with covetousness is? You're not going to be content with what you have. And brethren, how many Australians are not content with what they have? How many? Boy, listen, just go to Africa. I, listen, go to one of these third world nations. Go to Chile. I wouldn't even call Chile a third world nation. Go, go to a, one of these nations. You guys know what I'm talking about. Just have, brother, you've been to Brazil. Have you seen the, the poverty there? Listen, just go somewhere else outside of Australia. Well, you can't go outside of Australia now, can you? 
<laughs> you got to take the vaccination to go international. Go, go on YouTube and look it up now. Okay? <laughs> go to YouTube and look it up. All right. Have a look how these people live. Have a look how they go hungry. Have a look how corrupt their governments are. You think our government's corrupt? Boy, go to one of these uh, Southeast Asia, Asian countries and see how corrupt they are. You want anything done by the government, you've got to bribe these people. That's common. Everyone knows you've got to bribe the government to, to have your documents you know, certified or whatever. I mean, just go and, and have a look how wicked some of these nations are. Have, have a look at how uh, some of these, these gangs are basically taking over uh, the, 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 these worlds and, and their people are suffering. You know, some of these communist countries where people can't even have their own possessions, right? And then you come back to Australia and I promise you this, uh, even if you don't own a house, you know, even if you're just a renter, you're just going to be content with what you have. You know, look at the space you have in your house. You thought it was small. Listen, I thought my house was small. It kind of is with, you know, 13 people. But, you know, I thought it was small until I went to Chile and had a look at some of the, how they live. You know, it feels like, you know, probably this space, they'll probably be happy to have this space that we have right here to live in. You know, but Australians are not content. They want more and more and more. You want to buy a house? It's going to cost you over a million dollars now in Sydney to buy a house. I mean, people just want more and more and more. And brethren, is it no wonder that God's judgment has fallen upon this land? We're not content with what we have. We've been blessed by God. We've been blessed by God. God has blessed this nation. But if we're not going to be content with what we have and we turn to covetousness, then God's going to say, well, look, if you're not happy with what I've given you, let me take it all away. Let me dig up your graves. Let me dig up all the things you've had in the past and just lay it out there for waste. Back to Jeremiah chapter 8, please. Covetousness. Please, brethren, be careful of covetousness. Nothing wrong with owning a house. Nothing wrong with having nice things, brethren. Nothing wrong. You work hard, brethren. God's blessed you. You have a paycheck. You're able to get yourself something nice. Praise God for it. Give thanks to God for it, right? But don't look on others and say, man, I wish I had what they have. That would be covetousness, right? Verse number 13. I will surely consume them. That's the title for the sermon. Saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. Why do, you, do we sit still, assemble yourselves, and let us enter into the, the defense cities, and let us be silent there? For the Lord our God have put us to silence, and give us, given us water of gold to drink, because we have sinned against the Lord." Uh, so you can see that uh, take, drinking uh, waters of gold, gold to drink, that's uh, a bit of waters. Man, look, we still have this. You were telling me about the water you buy, brother, how pure it is. Now, thank God we still have this water to drink. Imagine the judgment of God falling upon you and you had no choice but to drink disgusting, bitter, dirty water. You know, that's what they have. Listen, God's saying, look, wake up. The judgment's coming. Get yourself defended. Get yourself in a place where you can get at least some level of protection. You know, God's warning His people. He's put them to silence. Put them to silence. I think about this um, five people limit, whatever it was, to sing in churches. Or well, some churches that I know of, just the song leaders singing. Has God put in His people to silence? I don't know, just, just I, you know, <laughs> you know I, I'm, I'm studying for Jeremiah, I'm just seeing too many parallels. Now, not to the extent that they have, right? Not to that extent. You know, but I'm, I'm, I'm seeing these parallels and I just, I just read Jeremiah and just think, this is, this is Australia. This is, this is 2020. This could be 2021, right? Get into your defensed cities, right? There's bitter water to drink. You know, the, the, the idea here is kind of like drink, uh, like take your own medicine. You know that saying? Take your own medicine. You know, you, you, you know as, a, as a nation, we, we have uh, turned our backs against God. As a nation, we're, we're killing babies in the mother's womb. As a nation, we're, we're allowing these freaks, you know, this LGBT, ABC community to, to have all their rights. And we're just allowing all this stuff to go ahead. You know, and, and, and women, we're forcing our wives to go and work to, because we need to buy the big house. You know, instead of letting our, our, our mothers raise their children, you know, and, and, you know, in the nurture and admission of the Lord. You know, we're doing so much wickedness brethren in this land you know and it's sometimes you just go it's time to just take your own medicine that's what you wanted then that's what you're going to have you're going to be put to silence you're going to have to drink bitter waters 
It is bitter, isn't it? The restrictions are bitter. They're bitter. But I guess what we get out of that, brethren, is that, you know, Jeremiah's telling the people here, hey, get into the defended cities. It's not time to fight. You fight the Babylonians, you're going to lose. Sometimes it's, it's time to just defend yourself, right? Instead of going and fighting, just get into the defensive position, just take the, the, take the medicine, drink the bitter waters. That's what you need to do in this situation. That, fine. If that's what, that, needs to be ha- that needs to happen, then that's what needs to happen. Verse number 15. This is why I think 2021 might be worse. We looked for peace. I'm hoping 2021's peaceful. <laughs> I'm hoping Christmas is going to be wonderful. I'm hoping all the restrictions are gone and things are back to normal. We're looking for peace. Hey, we ought to pray for peace, right? We ought to pray that we live a quiet and peaceful life. Don't forget. Don't forget. We still pray for those things, right? But we looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of health, but behold, trouble. So we're looking for things to get better, but things may only get worse. In fact, for them, things only got worse. Things only got worse. So, you know, 2020 has been a challenging year, no doubt, challenging year. But don't get comfortable thinking that 2021 is going to be better. Don't get comfortable. It may get worse. I'm not prophesying that it's going to get worse. I'm not saying that. We're just looking at the Word of God. So let's just get our heads, you know, settled. right? Let's make sure we're just... We're mindful, all right, God, I don't know, this is a strange year, strange things going on, Lord. I'm sure it would have been strange to know that Babylon's going to come and wipe you out. It's going to be strange to know that your graves are going to be digged up and bodies are just going to lay around decomposing. It's all strange things, but things may very well get worse. May very well get worse. So, Reverend, just, just get right with God. Just bow your head in prayer and ask God to protect his people. Get into the defended cities. And, you know, our defense is God. That's our defense. You know, he's our strong fortress. He's our deliverer. We ought to go to that defense. All right? We need God's defense. Verse number 16. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the name of his strong ones, for they are come and have devoured the land and all that is, that is in it the city and those that dwell therein. So the people of the land, they're hearing the sound of war and destruction. They're hearing the sound of the horses. Verse number 17. And behold, I will send, this is God, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. Now, I I don't believe this is literal serpents at this point in time. I think he's talking about just the the Babylonians are are in that sense. Those those vipers, those serpents that are going to come and bite you. Right? And it says, look, which will not be charmed. Have you guys ever seen a snake charmer? I, I watched this video just, like, just yesterday. Uh, was, there was a video in India. I don't, have you seen that? Yeah? Where, where they have the little, I don't know, the little instrument. And they've got these, uh, you know, what do you call The cobras, right? And they're, and they're like, they're doing this kind of like, you know, thing. And, and they're not striking. They're not striking. But you can see that the snakes are agitated. You can see, right? But that's a, that's, they call that a snake charmer. They put the snake under hip, hypnosis or something. They think some type of hypnosis with that kind of music. And, and like, you know, uh, they don't strike out. That's the idea behind it, right? And it's, it's quite a show. It's quite, quite amazing. But what it's saying here is that these serpents that are going to come, you're not going to be able to charm them. Okay? So, I don't know. When the health inspectors turn up, we may not be able to charm them. Okay, they might strike. I don't know, right? You know, they're expecting when the Babylonians come that maybe we can make peace with them, maybe we can charm them, maybe we can satisfy them. Hey, maybe, maybe, hopefully, hopefully, they come. We say, hey, look, we surrender. We don't want to fight. Leave us alone. He says, look, it's not going to happen. You're not going to charm them. They're still going to strike. They're still going to attack. Get ready for it, right? Get ready for it. And then you can see verse number eighteen, Jeremiah's. Response, when I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. So look, Jeremiah could not find comfort in, in all this. All, you know, it was a bit too much for him, you know, taking in this prophecy that God was giving him, right? The Lord's hand of blessings and protection has been removed from the land, you know? And so Jeremiah is struggling with this. And brethren, again, you know, if, if, you're, if you're struggling, and I've struggled, I, you know, I'll just be honest with you. From the very beginning, I've struggled with this whole thing, you know. I'm at peace. Don't get, don't get me wrong. I'm at peace today. I'm not like, oh, man, I'm, I can't. But, you know, the first few weeks when we uh, couldn't have church, 
here and up there, I could not sleep. I could not sleep. You know, I, I'd be tossing and turning my bed. I'd get up and I'd be like, I'd just be miserable. Because I'm thinking, man, because I was up in Queensland. I'm like, God, I'm up in Queensland, all right? I, I've left my comforts of Sydney. I've left my family my family's Sydney. I've left my friends in Sydney. I've gone up there, Lord, to serve you, to start this church. And now I can't even have church. Like, this is the reason I went up there. Okay, I mean, I, I enjoy the place. It's wonderful. But, Lord, the reason I'm here and not having church, I felt useless. Now, I was unsettled. I was really unsettled by it. I'm at peace now. But I'm just saying, at the very beginning, I was very unsettled, right? You see, Jeremiah, he's unsettled. You know, he can't find comfort. And uh, maybe you today still can't find comfort. You know, don't let that get you down. You can see even a great man of God was struggling, right, with the judgment of God that's fallen upon his nation. Verse number 19. Behold, the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country, is not the Lord in Zion? They're asking the question. Jer Jerusalem's asking this question. Is God not here in Zion? Isn't he going to protect us from the Babylonians? Hey, we saw this at the very beginning of Jeremiah. God had departed from them. God was, o God was over. It was, it was over for them, right? God has left them. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? So they've got their false religion, that they're, that they're graven images, their strange vanities, empty things that they worship, whatever it is, and then you're coming and asking, where are you, God? Isn't that what our nation does? They hate God. They, 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 they're against the Bible. They mock Christians. But listen, everybody in this land and in this world, when they're going through difficulties, they say, God, where are you? Why don't you help us? I knock on the doors of people. You say, I don't believe anymore. Why? Oh, because God did not help me in this situation. You know, I had a child or I had a wife. Or I had someone that I love and, and they got lost. And where was God in all that? Where do you think God is? If you're worshipping false gods, if you're turning your back against God, you think you, God's just going to, you just, you just yell out to God and he's just going to turn up whenever you like? That's what, that's what they were behaving. They knew God, but they were worshipping these false gods. And when trouble came now, they were, oh God, where are you? Well, what? You've got, you know, let, let those graven images save you then, if that's what you want. Yeah? Verse number 20. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. So he's saying, look, things are over. There's not going to be, no more harvesting. Right? The, the summer is over. You know, we're, now get, get, get used to the cold weather. Get used to, you know, some tough days coming up, up ahead. You know, Things are not going to return back to normal, is what's, happened, what's being said there. I hope things return back to normal for us. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to happen, that's all, right? But things were not going to return back to normal. You know, even after they left the Babylonian captivity and came back and rebuilt everything, it was not the same. They did not re regain all their glory, you know, in the nature that they once held. But anyway, things are not going to return back to normal. Verse number 21. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. So this is Jeremiah again. He says, look, you know, just thinking about, you know, the daughters, the, the, the children, the, the young ladies that are, are going to suffer, right? They're going to be taken away into captivity. Who knows what's going to happen to them? Jeremiah's saying, look, I'm hurt because of that. You know, he's feeling the pain, right? He says, I am black. It's kind of the idea of mourning. He's upset. He's mourning about it. Astonishment have taken hold of me. It's, it's too much to bear. He's astonished at God's judgment. And again, I think Christians... In Australia, can be astonished at God's judgment because God's judgment is not preached. Just the love of God is preached. Yeah. Everything's going to be fine, brethren. It's not like that all the time. God's judgment is severe. Okay? God hates sin. Yeah. God casts souls that reject Jesus Christ into fire to burn for all eternity. Think about His wrath for a minute. And when you think about God's judgment and his wrath, I don't want to be facing his wrath, even as his child. I just, Lord, protect me. Defend me, Lord. Help me walk with you. Let's not get into that perpetual backsliding state. Hope that never happens to you, brethren. But it happened to them. It happened to God's people here in the Old Testament. Verse number 22. There is no balm in Gilead. Balm is like a soothing balm, right? It's like if you get sunburnt, maybe put a, uh, some type of balm. You know, to heal, right? He goes, look, there is no balm. There is no healing. Is there no physician there? There are no doctors. Like, no one's going to fix this situation now for Judah. There's no, no one's going to fix this pain. Okay? Why then is not the health of the daughter 
of my people recovered. All right, so as I said to you, you know, Judah basically here has a terminal illness. You know, it's a terminal sickness. That they're going to, they're going to perish. Okay? There's nothing. There's no medicine. There's no balm. There's no physician. There's nobody that can help Judah in this time. Because God's judgment is falling upon that nation. And they're going to be wiped out. They're going to be destroyed. Many. There's going to be great slaughter. There's going to be destruction. You know, the, the, I, 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 we can't see. You know, we don't, we don't know. We don't have history books. We don't have photographs. We don't have videos of this time. But as we go for this, isn't it going to be horrible for them? I mean, it's a complete and utter destruction of the people of God. All right? And hey, non-believers absolutely deserve it, deserve the judgment of God. Don't forget that God's people are also caught up in this judgment. And brethren, 2020, God's people, we are God's people. We are caught up in this judgment. We are caught up. Okay? Is it time to fight? I've taught before, you know, and I think here, no, it's time to just find defense. Just find somewhere safe to get to. And the safest place you can get to is just being God's will. Just, just do what God asks us to do. See it through. You know, I'm the pastor of this church. This afternoon I'm going to be preaching on uh, the, the office of the, of the, sorry, the order of the local church. And, uh, you know, it's my job at least to, to help you guys to get through this time, you know, and help myself and my own family. So, you know, if any of you guys are struggling with this, and, you know, we're not always going to see eye to eye. It's strange, strange days, right? Lots of opinions. We're not always going to see eye to eye. But, you know, please understand that I, I love you as, my, as your pastor. I, I love you guys, and I hope you love me. You know, I'm praying for you guys every day. Every day I'm praying for you guys. I hope you're praying for me as well. You know, and, and we just have to find the solution. We have to find what are we going to do. You know, like Jeremiah, you get upset about these things, right? And, and sometimes, well, God's judgment's coming, and we're just going to have to take it. We're just going to have to drink that medicine with the rest of this wicked nation. And maybe it's, it's a good thing. We need the fear of God to come back to this land. We really need the fear of God back in this world. You know, when we look at the, the end times, I'm not saying the end times are around the corner. I, I don't know when the end times are. Could be a hundred years away. Who knows, right? But when the end times comes, Jesus says that the gospel of his kingdom will be preached throughout all the nations. Okay? You know what? When things get difficult, that's going to be the time that God's people are going to be, do, to be doing, able to do the greatest works. So let's just see this through. Let's just get into the defense right now, okay? Let's just protect ourselves, all right? Let's just walk closely with God. Let's not get in that backslidden state, okay? And just accept that this is God's judgment, okay? Let's not be like the people of God that don't know the judgment of God. I think we need to wake up to it. It is the judgment of God. It is the judgment of God. Let's just do the best we can, serve God, and ask God to protect us. And ask God that even if 2021 is worse than 2020, that it'll be the best year for us <laughs> as God's people. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, thank you for the great truths in Jeremiah. And uh, Lord, it's hard to preach for these things. It's hard to sort of uh, absorb it, Lord. And uh, sometimes it's easy to read the Bible, Lord, thinking about, well, that's another nation, that's another people. But Lord, those things are written for our profit, for our admonition, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that we would pause and, and meditate on these words and, and consider where we are, Lord. Uh, Lord, help us not to be people that are filled with covetousness.